It's 2.35 a.m. on the back of a bird scooter hurtling down Melrose Avenue. And you're listening to Night Call. Hello and welcome to Night Call, a podcast for your strange days and lonely nights. My name is Emily Yoshida in Los Angeles. And with me here in the studio, I have Molly Lambert and Tess Lynch. What up, guys? We're in the same room. Physical space, not just mental space, is being shared today. Physical space is the greatest special effect of all. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) Today, we are going to talk about the movie Hereditary. Also, way back in on the Mayo Wars, get some follow-up on the murder board. We've got to update our stories. And as always, give us a call at 24046-NIGHT. Or an email. Exactly. Jinx. Personal jinx. <laughs> <laughs> this week, I am in Los Angeles, as previously established, um, and we had our first ever night call live show. Yeah, we did. At Tex slash Tay restaurant in Echo Park. It was fabulous. It was so much fun. We are forever grateful for everybody who came out and hung out with us and had a weird buffet-style French dinner with us. Yeah. Um, it, we, it was a cult ritual. It, I think we just have to was. just say, spoiler alert, yeah. we made everyone stand and repeat a pledge. To Satan. And our podcast. <laughs> uh, you know, Tess was not as comfortable with uh, hailing Satan as uh, I, I was expected. The Catholic, I was shocked by how uncomfortable. The I was, Catholic I jumped know. out. The Catholic jumped out. Yeah, it did. It did. I went home and I I saged myself and I was I like cleansed my aura. I felt really. It was weird. It in the abstract, I'm totally fine with that. Uh, and uh, then I, when it was my mouth having to say words, I was like, no, I don't think I can do that. No, that's that. how I felt after watching Hereditary last night. I was cool. like, that was evil, and I need to take, like, a silkward shower in Rose Quartz right now. Save it. We're not there We're yet. We're not there yeah, yet. We'll get there. We were very <laughs> grateful for everyone who came and especially everybody, you know, who stayed as we DJed and yeah. party. And our special guest, Ryan Johnson, yeah, who came you. to talk to us about The Exorcist and other satanic evil films. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan Johnson told us about other horror movies he wasn't allowed to watch as a kid because yep. we found out uh, he was forbidden from watching movies because of Christianity, mm-hmm. as was Emily. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Except Ryan, wasn't it that Ryan couldn't watch Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yeah. Because well, it was it was dark-sided. I know, but it's it was a shocking revelation. Yeah, it is. It does really explain a lot about... I mean, but Raiders of the Lost Ark, like, believes that the Ark of the Covenant, like was a thing that exists <laughs> you know like yeah but it, it melts goes- your face if you get too close to it well i believe that <laughs> <laughs> if you're evil that is um, um if you are a nazi but uh, i also feel like being having raiders of the lost ark withheld from you if somebody was like you can't see that movie because it'll melt your face off of course then you would see it it would the melt- forbidden fruit the forbidden of the, the ark face melt yep um we have a call, a night call that we wanted to start off with just to jump off of what Molly and Tess were discussing last week when I was away. Menoise. <laughs> Men- <laughs> Menoise. Emily uh, Men- was in Venice and Tess and I took that opportunity. We were going to have a discussion about sauces and mm-hmm. what the best sauce is. And we just ended up talking about mayonnaise for like the whole time. Yep. It's a hot topic right now. Yeah, but we were saying like when we left, we were like, wait, we didn't even get into hot sauce at all. Yeah. That was one of the main things we were going to talk about is how the best sauce that we both agree is the best sauce is crystal sauce. Okay. I was going to say, yeah, I was going to ask what the best sauce is. Crystal hot sauce because it has the hip tang, which is a term that we learned from Dr. John when he was on what, Top Chef? Yeah. He was on Top Chef and they did a make a hot sauce competition. He was like, the thing that makes a hot sauce good is the hip tang. Which is like vinegar. It's the vinegar. It's like a tang. It's the umami. Flavor. Yeah, and they're like That's, salty. I would say that I would say Crystal gets that right, but Tabasco also is extremely vinegary, and I think that that it kills it. Um, Tabasco is not as good as Crystal. That no. is our, our well, main... also because you can't use as much with Crystal, you can really dump yeah. that sauce. Well, before we get into this sauce question, can I just also read a follow up text we got from Andrew T about sauce? You yes, must. he says. 
I almost put my head through the windshield when Tess called black vinegar that sauce they have at Din Tai Fung. I'm sorry, Andrew. <laughs> then he said, whoops, should have saved my outrage for the ponzu versus soy sauce take. Oh, sorry, Andrew. <laughs> Wait, what was the ponzu versus soy sauce take? Well, I think that Ponzi was better. Well, here's let me clarify. Ponzi? When I said I wasn't calling the black vinegar the sauce they have at Din Tai Fung, I was referring to the trinity of the soy sauce they have at Din. There's everybody yeah. knows like there are you good and bad soy sauce. sauce. Yeah. It's the combination of what they offer with the ginger, soy, and black vinegar. Right. Yes. And black vinegar is not easy to come by at most, you know, like white, person, markets. white person markets. Yeah. So you go out of your way to get the black soy sauce. But then it's also like you're you're having to go to a lot of effort to get the ginger. You know, you have to get mm-hmm. the shredded ginger. They have all the elements to make the most delicious dumpling sauce in the world. That is the, the combination of all the things they have. It's the holy mm-hmm. trinity. So what I'm referring to is the ease of having all those things in <laughs> one place. I agree that black vinegar is its own thing, but I would not put black like, vinegar on the same level as the sauce that you make at Din Tai Fung or any good restaurant in the San Gabriel Valley or what it's like Din Tai Vung is a place that we've all gone. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Except uh, I sometimes I have a hard time remembering if I've actually gone because I've gone to wait in the line many more times than I've actually eaten there. <laughs> because it's like, oh let's do this and giving up like halfway through and all Emily, gosh. what's your number one sauce? Um my number one sauce like, is probably on like QP mayonnaise. Like Do you just squirt it on stuff? Uh yeah. Ugh. Well, my take on mayonnaise is that I think I think right now everybody's talking about how it's like the whitest condiment, but like Asian people go for mayonnaise and do mayonnaise better mm-hmm. than I think most European cultures who can't <laughs> see my my finger quotes <laughs> right now. QP is uh, a superior <laughs> it mayonnaise. Is. It is. It yeah. is is more it's got more of that that hip tang yeah. in it. Um QP mayonnaise on like fried foods on like on like okonomiyaki, which is like the the like cabbage pancake is like one of the best delights to man. QP <laughs> kind of reminds so me of like when you get Belgian fries and there's an aioli if you took out the garlic but kept yeah. the like yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a very good way to think there's about it. There's got to be a flavor that overwhelms the mayonnaise. The mayonnaise has to be a vehicle for some other flavor. It can't just be Oh, you know what else is a good one? And I couldn't believe you guys didn't bring this up because you said the word spread several times. (laughs) But the spread at In-N-Out Burger. That's Thousand Island. I know, but it's called spread. It's called spread. (laughs) Hey, can I tell you guys a secret, though? So the Bob's Big Boy Thousand Island is so far superior to the In-N-Out spread that I Oh, I remember you were talking about like, oh, I got a grip of Thousand Island. So you you can only get – it's a refrigerated sauce – but I'm going to say that Bob's Big Boy, if you get it, it's in the refrigerated aisle. It doesn't have a long shelf life. I buy like seven of those. And then you can get your burger from in and out and it makes – I'm telling you, it elevates it. Do you bring <laughs> back the burger and put the sauce on at home? I That's do. do you go to in and out and then you just have like a container of Thousand Island in your purse that you pull out? <laughs> I have not because it's not shelf stable. <laughs> Otherwise, you've got Thousand Island in your bag. Wait, is Thousand Island? (laughs) This is probably a really basic question, but is Thousand Island like ketchup and mayonnaise and relish mixed together? Essentially, but it's more sugary. I find like you know, if you try and make it at home, it doesn't capture it. It's pickle relish. You know what I like? Fucking remoulade. Oh, remoulade's great. Remoulade is like the superior Thousand Island to my mind. Well, it has a time and a place. Yeah. This episode of Night Call is brought to you by Care Of, a monthly subscription vitamin service that delivers completely personalized vitamin and supplement packs right to your door. So, Emily, I am totally skeptical about vitamins and supplements. Vitamins are magic. (laughs) I'm skeptical. I don't know. I never know. Um, But I had been feeling really run down, so I thought I would look into if I maybe had some kind of deficiency. And it turns out that like a lot of people, maybe even up to 90 percent, are not getting all of the FDA-recommended vitamins and nutrients they need to feel their best. You got to get that B12. It's important. <laughs> it's true. But it's it's kind of hard if you're skeptical, especially to know where to start because you're just kind of browsing the aisles and it's difficult without a game plan. So that's what makes Care Of really great. Um, you can take their quick, non-judgmental 
online quiz. And when I say non-judgmental, I was honest and I was kind of like expecting the results to shame me, but they didn't. They were just like, okay, that's you and we can work with that. Um, so they give you some vitamins to start with. Um, and the best thing is I thought that you can actually learn about what these vitamins and supplements do, um, why they're best for your diet and lifestyle and health goals and where they come from, which is awesome. Yeah. They're very transparent about where everything comes from, the sourcing. And you can pick what you want to work on. They're not going to necessarily tell you, here's 80 different vitamins that you need to be taking. If you want to work on sleep, if you want to work on uh, just making sure you have all of your your main nutrients that you need every day, there is a vitamin pack for you. Also, it's super great because they have like they have a scientific advisory board, which is super nice. And so you can actually like look at how many double blind studies have been done, what the results were. I thought that was really helpful. I, I personally am saying this not just because we have an ad spot from care of, but starting a vitamin regimen is one of the things that keeps me sane in this life. So I, I highly recommend their product. It makes it so easy to figure out what you need and what you need to take every day. And the, another great thing about care of is that they donate a portion of every sale to the Good Plus Foundation, which provides expecting mothers in need with prenatal vitamins. And their supplements are available in vegan and vegetarian options as well. So there's something for everybody. If you would like to get 25% off your first month of personalized Care of Vitamins, visit TakeCareOf.com and enter code CALL. Again, for 25% off your first month, visit TakeCareOf.com and enter code CALL. Listen, I think let's, we should get yeah, to the email. Let's we get to, to this. listen to this email. Or, yeah. This Good email now. comes from Megan. Hello, Molly, Tess, and Emily. I agree with Molly's opinions about mayo, and I find that I will only eat dishes with well-hidden mayo. I'm from Iowa and grew up around a lot of mayonnaise-based foods. I once went to a funeral of a distant relative where they served kinds of salad sandwiches like chicken salad, egg salad, ham salad, etc. I ate the top three rolls and didn't touch the mayo salads. This is getting long, but my main point is Miracle Whip. My sister loves mayonnaise but hates Miracle Whip. A quick Google search informed me that Miracle Whip was created in 1933 by Kraft as a less expensive alternative to mayonnaise. My sister will not touch Miracle Whip and will even avoid restaurants if she knows they use Miracle Whip. Any thoughts about the sauce that has been called boiled dressing or salad dressing spread? <laughs> also, have you ever heard of Snickers salad? We've had it at my gran grandpa's house growing up. I've attached the recipe here, which we will add to the notes on this podcast. What? I want to uh, know what's in Snickers salad to start off. Well, first talk amongst yourselves. Well, pull okay. It up. So I, um, as some of our listeners may know, um, am also from Iowa. I worked in the deli, the grocery deli at our, gro at our grocery store in Iowa City for about a year. Um, and it involved slinging mayonnaise-based um, potato salads and um, ham salad is the worst. Ham it's salad the worst. Is, it's pink. is the worst idea for a food. And I and I am not opposed to chicken salad. I think I think it could be quite good. Ham but salad is the funniest term in the world. Have so you nasty. ever seen ham salad, Molly? It's I not have, common out I here. I have had ham I have seen it. I once made a friend of the podcast, Max Silvestri, take a bite of a ham salad sandwich and then spit it up into our other friend's hand for a film I made. Well, so this is this is the technical thing I want to get into here, which is that um, we had giant vats of mayonnaise, of course, because this is a grocery store in the Midwest. But we all, to make the, the salads, there was actually a different substance that you used as the base for it that was called salad dressing that was also white and basically was – I think it was basically Miracle Whip. But it was a little more runny. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and not quite – I think you had more tang to it too. Um, There's a British thing called salad cream. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. That I feel like falls into this category also. It's somewhere between like a runny sour cream and mayonnaise. It's also the idea of you just like mayonnaise is your salad dressing. You just want like a runny mayonnaise right. for your salad. Well, Guys, haven't, haven't you ever mixed up a salad dressing from some mayonnaise and mustard and like uh, yeah. vinegar and stuff? No. Yeah, it's great. Oh, yeah, it's really good. Mayonnaise. I'm going to tell you really quick about Snickers salad. So this is from Taste of Home magazine, the recipe, candy bar apple salad. This creamy, sweet Snickers salad with crisp apple crunch is a real people pleaser. It, it makes a lot. Is fluff? Oh, you'll, you'll see. <laughs> it makes a lot, which is good because it'll go fast. One and a half cups <laughs> cold 2% milk, 
one package instant vanilla pudding mix, one carton frozen whipped topping thawed, four large apples chopped, four Snickers candy bars cut into one half inch pieces. Well, they got to eat that fruit somehow. <laughs> I don't uh, even understand what that would make. Well, so that's like a, it's a that's pudding, like a, apple. It's like it's a, a thoroughly bastardized Waldorf. Waldorf, yeah. Yeah. But Waldorf doesn't have candy. It's no. just like apples. It's and a whatever. Waldorf it has salad. So if it's like the Snickers is your nuts portion. And, <laughs> it, and instead of mayonnaise, you have pudding. Yeah. What? <laughs> It's real 70s dinner party right yeah, there. Yeah, 70s dinner party. Shout Dang. out to one of our favorite Instagram accounts that just is all stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Miracle talk Whip about, is yeah. not mayonnaise. Yeah, we should talk about it's Miracle It's not Whip. mayonnaise, and it is, it's awful. It belongs nowhere. You know, I also worked in a cafeteria, and I want to know, like, my main experience of working with bulk food was that it would, like, put me off some things forever, you know? Yes. Like, it did. It, it put me off of fried chicken forever because I had to fry the chicken. Right. Ooh. Like, the fact that you, like, dealt with big vats of mayonnaise and came out of it just, like, pro-mayonnaise. Well, I didn't. At that time, I was not that big of a mayonnaise fan. What got me into mayonnaise... This is, again, my argument for why mayonnaise is not necessarily the whitest food ever. I like this argument. It was, one, going to Six Flags when I used to, like, work with these kids, like, at this after-school program, most of whom were Hispanic um, and Mexican, and they would they introduced me to the joy of getting, a, like, a cone of French fries and dumping mayonnaise and hot sauce all over them, mm-hmm. which I hated mayonnaise before that, and I was like, oh, this is... This is like Belgian, but like on on a different level entirely. Like this <laughs> no, you're is right so though. Much there's better. also like there's mayonnaise on a lotus. There's like yeah, the no, argument, totally. Like mayonnaise is used widely. I I'm not I'm not trying to make like a grand objective argument against it. I'm just saying like subjectively to me, it tastes bad. The way that to you, Emily, an even more controversial opinion, you like don't eat cheese, which is like, but to you, cheese, like all cheese, like just doesn't taste good. It doesn't. I mean, I, I, I appreciate the idea of cheese, but I can't personally do it. I'm, I, not, I, I'm, I'm, not, cheese. I'm not trying to get other people on my wavelength. You said something once where you were like, I think, I don't know if you were talking about the 30 Rock episode, but you were like, yeah, other people talk, like, you know how other people just will, like, eat a whole block of cheese at night? And I was like, what are you, I have no idea what you're talking about. (laughs) You were like, I can't imagine ever doing that. Like, what is that like? And I I was like, that's crazy. (laughs) Do you eat a block of cheese at night? No, but like, I eat. you get so phlegmy? I eat (laughs) cheese. Yeah, but like, I am lactose intolerant. I just like, sometimes. I just, I just, you know, chase the cheese dragon. (laughs) The um, cheese dragon. I'm on Kraft's website right now, <laughs> and they have reviews of Miracle Whip. Um, and wow, yeah, somebody contacted them about. Okay, this new blend is nasty. It is still labeled the original. However, it is far from it. Check the ingredients if you have an old bottle around versus a new one. The old bottles say salad dressing on them. The new something about creamy mayonnaise taste. I, for one, will never purchase Miracle Whip again in its current mix. Ooh. Good. Um, Good. Yeah. No. And, and others, may they follow your example. Like, let's drive out the Miracle Whip. The other thing about Miracle Whip is it is full of sugar. Yeah. Um, mm. And it, I think that, because it, it was supposed to have, like, less the fat, less fat or something than mayonnaise, but I think it's just, like, like eating there's got to be people who like miracle whip better than mayonnaise though just because they like enjoy the taste of it but there is no taste is the point right but you know some people like they just want the the you want the moisture yeah the slide you want the lotion for your sandwich it puts the lotion on its ham (laughs) it is ham lotion it is Oh, you guys are really selling it to me. Hey, actually. Hey, buy some delicious ham lotion. Ham lotion is a It'll really great segue. It'll make your ham segue. salad go down just right. I think, I think we have to Now's table this Now's a good time to now. talk about other things that like made Satan. me feel like I was going to throw up for two hours. Guys, Hereditary is now out on video on demand. I was counting the days. Oh I've been God. so excited we, to see this movie. We're talking about this movie and it, when it came out in theaters, which must have been in the spring. It was in the, it was over the summer. In the sum, in early June, summer. Yeah. yeah, time is such a, a roller coaster right mm-hmm. now. Who can tell? Nobody knows. But yeah, I was. We were. Tess was like definitely doing a, a watch clock of how many days were left until yes. this movie came out, and then she watched it, and then y'all were like, Molly, you have to watch it. 
And then I did. You kind of volunteered. I well, I, I was very profoundly disturbed by Hereditary, but I loved it. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not going to force her to watch it. Yeah, but no, I'm, you yeah. had a diplomatic way of putting it. Thank like, you. I will well, not put this on it. I was also yeah. like, I don't want to be the person who didn't see the movie. And like, I managed to not get spoilers for it until now. I should just watch it. And then I couldn't convince my boyfriend to watch it with me. So I watched it alone. And that was a mistake. <laughs> so... <laughs> Hereditary uh, is an interesting – so we were talking before we started recording the podcast about how um, Hereditary is the first feature-length film from Ari Aster, I believe is his name. And he was known for two really controversial shorts that he did um, before Hereditary, one of them Munchausen, which um, deals with a problematic mother-child relationship – one of them, I think it's called The Strange Thing About the Johnsons, which was his AFI thesis, um, which is... No a, spoilers. No yeah, spoilers. Uh, just look it up if you're curious. Controversial. Yeah. But just... Um, it is, yeah. yeah. It is perhaps deals, the most taboo preface. He makes <laughs> movies about familial horror. Yeah. Which is probably our favorite genre of horror. I think it's the most affecting genre, subgenre of horror, I would well, say. we are talking about it's like The Exorcist. Is that... And Rosemary's Baby is that. The Shining is that. Mm -hmm. All of these things are about parental relationship. Mm -hmm. Guys, I've never seen Poltergeist. Oh, my God. Oh, (laughs) you haven't seen Poltergeist? What's going on? I just know that the parents smoke pot and that it's like a chill, a chill movie. It's okay. a very chill movie. So chill. Yeah. yeah. Makes you very when concerned about cu- digging a pool. Are, yeah. Should I watch yeah. it? Yes. It's right. so good. Yeah. Poltergeist is pretty good. Can we good. just do a horror movie like every week until yeah, the end of so. Halloween season? Yes. It's already begun as far as I'm concerned. Let's do it. Last week after the podcast, I walked to the Halloween store in the old Circuit City down the street. Oh, nice. I was like, the me and some other people were like the first people in the Halloween store. <laughs> like, hey, great. It's September 7th. <laughs> um, so, so I was her- ready for Hereditary. <laughs> <laughs> so Hereditary, um, I did not see it at Sundance when it was there, but it was one that everybody – like this is the thing now. Sundance is like the best place. Like it- it's iffy on other things coming out of there, but like all the horror stuff that comes out tends to be pretty A+. plus. There's been so much good horror coming yeah. out in general. And my friend um, – um, Aaron also co-wrote the other good horror film that came out of it that's coming out this week, I think, um, called Mandy with Nick Cage in it. Oh, I watched the trailer for that yeah. also, and it also seems like it's – there's a lot of just uh, – People are – it's a good time right horror. Now. It's yeah. a good time for horror. I mean, I know there's a lot of – debate within horror about the sort of art house horror well yeah i kind of wanted to talk about that a little bit because i think that a lot like after this film came out and and the first you know wave of people saw it and people talked a lot about how like it's not like a dumb horror movie right which is what people always say it's like "Mm, all the good horror movies are smart also i mean if you like horror films like there are some that are clearly made with a bigger budget or with producers who can get like fancy actors like Tony Collette and Gabriel Byrne and then there are ones that don't and doesn't really actually reflect that much on the premise or the ability to be scary. Well, you know what horror. producers got those stars? Tony Collette and Gabriel Byrne. <laughs> 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 yep. Um Tony Collette is so amazing in this film. It cannot be said enough. Um, I think that this film worked better for you guys than it did for me. I really like it and I appreciate it and I think it's very smart and well made. Um, But I think that we can all agree that Tony Collette is just like, um, like, there's, I haven't seen a a more, a more performance. She's (laughs) the best. Um, All the performances were great in this movie, though. And I mean, I thought that they were really like the the girl whose name is Millie and I forget her last name. Who She originated the the role of Matilda Matilda. on Broadway. Phenomenal um, in it as well. I mean, everybody in this movie really carries their load. I also thought it was funny she originated Matilda because then they contact her through the seance and there's like chalk writing on a chalkboard. (laughs) Spoiler. We're going to maybe spoil this movie. I don't know how much we should spoil it necessarily. All right. Yeah. But we'll, we'll, we'll feel it she out. She was but. not the one who communicated via chalkboard. She was, um, there's a, okay. there's another person okay. beyond. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Um, we well, all like Nat Wolf or Alex Wolf, one of the Wolf brothers, one of the Naked Brothers band brothers. I think it's Alex, I think it's Alex Wolf. They're both in movies. Uh, he plays the son. He was really great. Gabriel Byrne is really great. Tony Collette, we were saying like she should have the Tilda Swinton level of fandom from people because she's she's the mom of this family 
Um, she's an artist who does miniatures. So we were saying it was like a side quill to tiny furniture. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I love miniature stuff. I love like shooting miniature stuff on film and that depth of focus. Like I, I like a lot. And but there is something unsettling about it, and I've never seen it used to like a horror purpose. In yeah, the same it way. was used very well. It was yeah. like like using the tweeness of it to be creepy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so she, her mom has died and her mom had this like special bond with her daughter. And so they're doing the funeral and the wake and everything. And, um, and the daughter is kind of uh, not dealing with, it's like hard to, I mean, the daughter is, a. Uh, how would you describe The her? daughter is evidently disturbed. Yes. Yeah. And does a, has a tick where she goes like that a lot the daughter is disturbed <laughs> and the actress who plays her is very interesting looking yeah. and has a very memorable face and and then there are like some twists that you don't see coming that i just thought it was going to be a totally different movie yeah um it was reminded me also of get out in that it was like what I thought it was going to be was so different from right. what it ended up being. Had a lot and of switcheroos. A, well, just also like it went in places that like I hadn't ex- didn't see before. I didn't see coming. Right. It has that feeling that I think makes it more scary where there's not a symmetry to it that there is for a lot of horror films where like everything you plant at the beginning ends up kind of like coming back in some like a, a way that you can appreciate it as being clever or something. At Some the of end. that does happen, but then it I'm does. like, oh, it makes you want to it's, vomit yeah, because it's that, you yeah. feel so unsettled. Well, I thought what was interesting, my husband keeps being like, let's watch it again and find all these hidden, because there's a lot of hidden yes, symbolism and I'm stuff. Sure. But one thing that I almost missed was um, that in the brother, whose character's name is Peter, in his high school class, they're talking about Greek mythology. And in an interview, and I think maybe Variety, um, the filmmaker was saying how he was really into the idea of, in Greek tragedies, how little kind of autonomy the characters have, how they're just kind of pulled along by fate and they can't really change the outcome of their story. And so he said that this was kind of a story about characters who, despite anything they did to try to correct the course, the outcome was already predestined and they were just kind of caught in this, you know, system. Um, which is super interesting when you think about it, too, in terms of there are obvious um, connections between, like, the hereditary kind of curse, if you will, that is, has been, you know, put on this family by this matriarch who died. But also um, Tony Collette's character talks a lot about how mental illness in her family has kind of, like, caused all this trauma. She has two kids and she's, you know, clearly kind of talking about the like hereditary nature of, you know, the trauma, both like the trauma inflicted by like the death of her mom, who was secretive and crazy, and also just like the genetics. Right. It gets away with both being a metaphor and actually the thing. Exactly. Which is great because then the boundary between the two is so fuzzy that when you're thinking about it on your own, you're like – you know, if you if you've known anybody who's dealt who's dealt with the like realistic half of it, then you're like, oh god, that makes it like so much more. I don't know, it just gets under your skin more. That's yeah. kind of what the. I mean, I know you guys weren't super into it, but Sharp Objects also was very into a lot of the same territory of just like inherited sorrow, yeah. inherited yeah, inherited issues, and like you know, acknowledging them and then changing them, or like repressing them and then also not being able to change them, and yeah, just sort of like. You don't get to choose. What do you guys make of the discrepancy between the critical reviews of Hereditary and the audience well, reviews? Well, it did you, really well, But though. on Cinema Score, it got a D plus. But on Rotten Tomatoes, it got like a 90 or something. But it became like a viral hit. Like it went wide really fast. I think it made the most of any A24 movie. I think I thought it was more of like a Conjuring type like jump scares movie. I thought the whole movie was going to be about the creepy little girl and her like becoming the grandmother or something. And then that's not what it was at all. You know, if I'm not, maybe they did one limited release like New York, L.A., but I think they very, very quickly went wide. And I don't think it was I don't think it was a box office thing. I think it was that they just knew they wanted to, like, release it to it. Because I remember being in North Carolina, like, the second week it was out and seeing it at, like, a multiplex there. Like, I think it went. And I think I think it was one of those ones where they just, like, built the right kind of word of mouth about it. And then by the time people actually saw it. 
you know, some people were disappointed because it, it ended. They want make, jump scares. It made them feel worse than they were prepared to feel. Yeah. Right? Another like low cinema score film that I think is fantastic and like maybe not even a horror film necessarily, but certainly a spooky film is The Witch, which is like another right. Film. There's, there's the, you know, um, I think all of us probably are in the category of liking like a uh, spooky psychological horror, mm-hmm. not not complete like i also not at the expense right like i also like slasher films i definitely like tuned out of horror during the torture porn phase because it like wasn't for me but then i like think the first saw movie is good you know (laughs) like there's nothing gimmicky in this movie that relates it to like other types of horror I feel like. There's right. a lot to dissect and I think I mean it reminded me a little bit of It Follows which yeah. I understand I'm like very basic for loving It Follows no, and I, everybody's got an opinion but it in follows the same, you can also, unpack it for a lo- like a much longer time than you can unpack most recent horror I It think. just builds all this dread and yeah. then it like releases it all right. at the end but then you still feel really bad. I was saying the movie it also felt like to me was a serious man mm-hmm. which was another movie I made the mistake of like watching alone you know and then I was like just sitting there like I just want like to hug like anyone <laughs> like I feel yeah. so bad right now I think there's something I maybe this is a part where we can spoil it briefly or we can tell people to yeah let's say spoiler zone starting now so I, I I thought it was interesting to think about hereditary as it compared to the witch actually and sort of other general narratives that have been going on right now in horror and this like idea of this kid the boy in this instance like the son being the like king payman the the king of hell or whatever what what's his actual he's title he's like the god of mischief i think the god of mischief okay he's a little pazuzu man yeah um i saw a really amazing fan art done of of king payman like recently mm. online that was very spooky and good and then something like as opposed to the witch where it's also about an adolescent girl this time who kind of discovers that she has satanic or occult powers or potential or something like that but i think the end of the witch is much more almost victorious in a way um even if it is a little bit like if if it has a dark side to it it's not it doesn't color the entire way that the ending of that film feels um and also frankly the ending of the new suspiria feels um and i think that's interesting that like the story about the boy who comes from this cursed family and has this destiny to be this, like, demonic leader or god figure or something, that feels like he's just fucked. Right. <laughs> As opposed to, like, yes, girl, like, yeah. claim that crown. Yeah. Like, cover yourself in blood. Like, I think that's I think that's super interesting. It what is. if um, I, a little bit, though, was like, yes, Queen Lee, <laughs> you did it. Yeah. Well, my husband, after we watched it and before he suggested we see it again, and I was just like, no. Um, we had looked at Paymon, and he was like, oh, he's he's, you know, kind of like a you know, trickster. And he was like, maybe what this is really about is like the mind playing tricks on the character of Peter, the Mm. son, and that the whole thing is really just about, you know, his kind of like nervous breakdown and spoiler, 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 spoiler. Like he murders his family and then like has basically had a complete psychotic break. And the final scene, which everybody was very divided. And I think a lot of people who didn't like the movie kind of point to the final scene as being too heavy on exposition and stuff like that. But what if that scene is is not what it is, but it's just him completely breaking with reality. And in a way, the tree house, how, you know, she deals in miniatures inside this house that's kind of like this weird, like a lot of hallways and little rooms. And then there's the tree house, which is small and it's a single room and it's usually lit up red. What if that doesn't actually exist and that's kind of like a realm unto itself mm. where people go to like be crazy, yeah. essentially? Well, there is, yeah, there's like the moment when like Peter looks in the reflection and it's like he's, he's making grinning. a different face yeah. in the reflection. Yeah. That that That's was like very freaky. subtle yeah. and freaked me out very bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it ends up being Peter's story, despite him having the least to do for yeah. most. No, of you the think film. it's going to be all about Charlie, and then spoiler alert: Charlie gets dispatched with. Yeah, you know and that was we're, so intense, real we're, intense way. Um, I mean, I think I think the thing about Greek mythology is super interesting, and that is so also not a way 
that movies now, especially horror movies, tend to work. But maybe that's one of the big differences between what what people are calling arty horror movies and non arty horror movies is the agency of the hero. This makes The Shining seem upbeat, though, because at The Shining they get away at the end. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. Um, It's it's a it's a very downer movie i mean it's it's in the shining it's like it ends up that it's like he's just fucked jack is just like stuck there but the other people get away this is like no you're fucked and nobody else can escape especially your family especially your family (laughs) well because that was so much fun maybe we should have take a time to have an update on a question that was called in a few weeks ago that we've all been mulling over. Now for some real life murder. Yeah. All right. So here is a night call update. Hey, guys. This is Chaz, the woodworker, who apparently has now become known as the guy with the murder board. Um, calling to give you an update, I guess. Uh, i listen to the show and all the advice you had and the commentary. There's a lot to think about. I really appreciated that. Uh, I had no idea that your fans were going to get so interested and start having polls and things. But anyway, just to clear up a couple things, um, a lot of people asked about, was it unsolved? Uh, no, the murder was not unsolved. The person uh, who did it was in the house when the police were, they were found like immediately. So it's not a thing where you can, you know, solve the mystery and be like Nancy Drew or whatever. Um, I guess the other update is that I did decide to take the job uh, after listening to a lot of feedback, including yours. Um, So that's pretty much it. Uh, I got a couple things in front of it, and I already told them it's going to take a Probably at least two months, but I will try to email you some pictures when it's done. No, I do not think I am opening a portal of death to anything. I, you know, and <laughs> as far as the questions about the wood that was used, no, I, I cannot prove that that wood had blood on it. It has weird discolorations. I'll, I'll send you a picture. Uh, but again, you know, it's a paying customer and how much I believe in it, I don't know. Hopefully, my next call will not involve my basement turning into, like, an Indian barrel ground with, you know, tombstones coming up to the floor. But uh, that's pretty much it. And, you know, thanks for answering the question. And uh, take care. Jed, thank you so much for the update. I really hope we didn't put you on the spot. No, thank you for the update. I feel like this is great. This is our second actual I don't want to call it a case because we didn't solve anything. Well, it's but a thread. It's, it's a, a thread. mystery, kind yeah. of, after the the mystery of the ice cream truck ghost, which we did solve. Yes. This, it, it's and just then satisfying. Emily texted us the oh, yeah. same ice cream I truck passed, hello. Yeah, I passed by an ice cream truck that made the hello sound. So, so scary. <laughs> Synchronicity, guys. Um, I'm glad, Jed, that you're getting that money. Um, I am glad that they caught the perpetrator of the grizzly murder. Yes, that was. A, I think that was probably our biggest piece of missing information. So I'm glad that we have that now. And I look forward to seeing the results. <laughs> Molly looks uncertain. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I'm. You know what though? But you'll say he'll see. That's it what I was just going to say. <laughs> I, I am such a hypocrite because I'm the person who's like, don't do it. But then I made everybody say hail Satan. You did because I'm just a cavalier. Well, I. I sensed that it was not a bloody piece of wood from his call. I think that I I feel like we wouldn't be having this conversation if it was. No, he said it, didn't he literally just say like I can't prove it but there's discoloration? No, he said I can't prove the discoloration is blood. He doesn't think it's blood. Yeah. Yeah. But he doesn't think it's he doesn't necessarily know it's not blood. It's just a funky piece of wood. Look, it's he a funky is piece just of wood. a humble woodworker. <laughs> yeah. Like just the guy trying to make his bread. Who played Jake Ryan. We were saying what if it is the guy who played Jake Ryan, because we know he's a woodworker. So well, you should tell our listeners that we were just talking about sixteen candles and that's where you got candles. Jake Ryan is the name of the hot guy in sixteen well, just candles. It's funny to talk about people whose profession is woodworking. He's a woodworker now. He retired from acting. He is too hot to have retired from acting, but that's the decision oh, he made. And I went to the magic castle for a magician swap meet that my friend emma cunningham who along if you with, came to our dinner if you came to our live show emma both 
help set up the stereo, the sound, and uh, did card magic for people. She did practical magic and (laughs) magic for show. Emma and her friend Anoop both did some some strolling card tricks, and it was the greatest. I was informed that we actually interrupted, like, a really good card trick of Anoop's. (laughs) We just waltzed in, and he had to, like, stop his card trick, and I felt terrible. I kind of was like, why are we even doing a show? We should just let our friends practice their card magic. Next time, there will be more magic. Yeah. Yeah. But I went to the Magic Castle for a swap meet, which was amazing because it was all magicians just selling tricks and pamphlets that explain tricks. Um, just none of that exists. Exists. They obviously are all doing real magic. Um, but in the lobby where you are allowed to take pictures um, in the gift shop, there was a Ouija board that is made of wood from the Magic Castle. And people oh. were like, that must be haunted also. For sure. For sure. We, but I didn't Ouija realize... boards figure, fi- factor into Hereditary as well. Yeah. I think I just... And uh, The Exorcist. Mm-hmm. I think I just didn't realize that much that... Um, oh, we also heard an amazing story from a friend of the podcast that involved a demon possession oh. and a Ouija board. Two yeah. different demon possession stories. Yeah. I don't want to say their identity in case the demons are looking for them. <laughs> but... Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear about this update. Um Keep us posted. Yeah, if the hell portal opens, I'm. How does it take two? Mu- I, I guess it's going to be a really nice Oisha port. Um, he has two- stuff to do in in front of it. He said. Mm-hmm. Oh, he has yeah. other He's things to get it up. to. He's, He's queuing, queuing it, it up. putting in in the queue. Man. Also, having tried to like do woodworking before, I can imagine that that takes a long time. Yeah. Maybe I asked a Ouija my dad board to actually. make a robot for me, and he whittled one out of wood, and it took a really long time. <laughs> Making a Ouija board does seem like it would be like a really fun woodworking project. Yeah, like as an endeavor, because it, it seems approachable. It's just it's doing that scoring, just doing all the 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 letters and stuff in it. That would be the time consuming thing. Yeah, that's like drawing. Well, maybe someday we'll get a night call Ouija board. Oh, and mm. speaking of making things, um, on the night call Facebook group, night callers, which you can go find. Uh, if you're good at finding things, should be easy. But somebody <laughs> was like, hey, we should talk about what merchandise people want. And it was just a person, a listener said this, which I'm very grateful to them for doing. But if you have an idea for merchandise, we are starting to talk about the possibility of doing merchandise in the future. So please weigh in. So far, people have suggested fanny packs and bike shorts. And we think both of those are great ideas. Yeah, man. I'm all into branded board games for things. <laughs> Should be easy to make those. <laughs> we just have to figure out the rules of our own game. And what about a night card tarot deck? Oh, nice night, night cards. Night cards. Yeah. <laughs> um, Do you guys want to hear some comments about mayonnaise that were left on my Instagram? Sure. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna skew these results, though. No, I'm not. People are all over the place. Um, somebody said. I'm no mayo evangelist, but it's a solid and vital condiment. That's exactly how I would describe it. Friend, solid of, the, and friend vital. of the podcast, Rachel True, says, I will listen, but honestly, mayo is the devil's semen. <gasps> Rachel, come on the podcast. Rachel, come on the podcast, please. We've been wanting you to come on the we podcast. We want you to come so on the bad. podcast, and we can talk about this too. And another person said, Was surprised how long the sauce talk went on for, and yet there is so much left to be said. Well, actually, speaking of which, I just looked at the Night Call Facebook, and uh, so far, the mayonnaise poll, let's talk about mayonnaise, baby. (laughs) Marissa, thank you for doing that. So the winner so far with three votes, mayonnaise is okay in an altered state, aioli, deviled eggs, etc. Mayo is delicious, comes in second. okay when you're on drugs. (laughs) (laughs) That's also true. <laughs> mayo is delicious. It's coming in second, and Mayo disgusts me. Only has one vote. Wow. Um, yeah. Well, if you take enough acid, the mayo comes alive. Well, it's it's base. <laughs> you need your acid, and you need your base. <laughs> <laughs> oh On that God. note, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening, Emily. See you soon. Thank you, Garden of Sound, for having us in your in your padded booth. For yeah. Us to thrash around and conversationally. <laughs> As always, if you're enjoying the podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. And if you have a question, comment, or story, call us at 240-46-NIGHT or email us at nightcallpodcast at gmail.com. We'll see y'all next week. Hey, I'll see you.